Um, we are very excited this year because uh, we're in our new space, Brock Common South, and uh, we have here are some pictures showing this is the outside entrance here, um, and you go through the, through that door there, and you have to have your UBC card activated so that you can get in by yourself. Otherwise, you if you want to get in and that look around, you'd have to knock on the door and hope that one of the staff members is inside. And uh, inside there is uh, a, there's a common uh, open area at the front here, and we'll see that in a minute in the other slides here. But uh, the big open area here, it's on the fourth floor of Brock Commons, and um, it's uh, we we uh, held the um, um, retreat there this year, so that was that was very exciting. This is the uh, op as soon as you go in this glass uh, area here in glass soft area, um, you see this open area here where uh, and there's uh, coffee coffee making facilities here, tea, and uh, you can have your lunch here if necessary. And just down the hallway here are the offices for the staff members. And to the left here is a big um, a meeting room here, which can be closed off with a sliding door or, or not. And um, that um, uh, is a very useful meeting for small meetings, for example, the executive or some members of council. And the office is staffed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 10 to noon and 2 to 4 at the moment. That could change, and we'll have to let people know if that's the case. So. Many of you have seen it now, but uh, please do come around uh, if you haven't and uh, get familiar with the space. So uh, again, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you all for coming out and uh, for the meet and the greet. And uh, thank you for the um, SIG members who have set up the tables over here and we're talking to people. Uh, and uh, probably trying to convince some of you to join. So we have, uh, I think there are 11 special interest groups now. And we're going to have a few words. The uh, UBCO group, um, the Emeritus College there, has an outdoor activities group, and they've made a short film here, and uh, we're going to show that now. Hello, I'm Ian Walker. Um, I retired about two years ago from of the Departments of Biology and Department of uh, Earth, Environmental and Geographic Sciences at UBC Okanagan, and I've asked, been asked to uh, say a few words about our new special interest group, the Okanagan Outdoor Activities Group. And so I have a few slides here that I'm uh, wanting to share, uh, just to give you a little bit of an introduction. And so hopefully this works pretty straightforwardly. Let's see. Okay, I hope you're seeing what I want you to see. Uh, but in any case, the Okanagan, the Okanagan Outdoor Activities Group is intended to be a kind of an umbrella, an umbrella for uh, any sort of outdoor activity taking place in the Okanagan that relates to the Emeritus College. So it's an umbrella for any sort of outdoor activity that could be hiking, cycling, canoeing, skiing, snowshoeing, and probably other things as well that I haven't just thought of off the top of my head. So far, we've uh, scheduled five events, um, and uh, four of those went off without a hitch. There was one uh, where we had a bit of a, a problem. In any case, the, the, first, um, the first of our events was a hike into Cousins Bay in Kalamalka Lake Provincial Park. That took place on May 4th. And part of the reason for doing that is there are a lot of spring birds coming um, back. The weather's nice. Uh, the trails are lined with um, lots of wildflowers and so on. And along the way, we uh, happened to come across three rattlesnakes. You know, three rat <laughs> rattlesnakes are, are, are really polite uh, and friendly. You know, they, they even wag their tails when you get close to them. So anyway, we had a good turnout for that, at least uh, rolls of what you might expect for our first event. Um, then the second event was uh, a cycling trip up at Myra Canyon on the Kettle Valley Railway. And that was led by Maury Williams. 
and he talked about the history and the archaeology up there. Um, before he retired, uh, he, together with uh, another faculty member, Richard Garvin, uh, had kind of a major project going on up there. And Maury has a book uh, that he published uh, not so long ago on the history of Myra Canyon and the engineering that went into it. Uh, our third event, I think of as being an inactivity rather than activity. So we stretched things. So this was on the 16th of July. We had a picnic in Kaloya Regional Park. And part of the reason for having a picnic is because it's just so hot. Given the stifling weather and, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, searing sun shining down upon us, we decided that walking 100 me 180 meters from the parking lot to a picnic table, that was about enough for one day. So that was July. Now, in August, we ran into a problem. Uh, so we had a trip scheduled on the Ga Gladstone Trail in Peachland with Diana French, but um, no one showed up. And so apologies, Diana. And so somehow the advertising was inadequate. And so to help alleviate that in the future, we've set up a new listserv, or Melanie Jones set up a new listserv to improve communication among our interested members. Any, any member of the college who might be interested can ask and we'll add them to that listserv. Okay, and then, well, just this past weekend, we had a fungal foray um, starting from Beaver Lake Road in the country and hiking into Wrinkly Face Provincial Park. And Dan Durall led that. And so at the beginning of the hike, we uh, Dan talked a bit about mushrooms and we collected some mushrooms. And then we went on to have our hike. So that's what's happened so far. Now, later on this fall, we'll continue to have activities, um, presumably about one per month. So in October, we're tentatively talking about a hike into Angel Springs, which is a warm spring uh, close to Kelowna. November, we tentatively kicked a, a, an around idea that uh, maybe cycling would be appropriate. But it partly depends on what the weather is like at that time of year here. Uh, December, there was some thought of maybe participating in the local Christmas bird counts. And in January, Nordic skiing. In any case, that's basically all that I have to say. And if you want to be added to our listserv, there's my email address there. Just send me uh, an email and we can add you. And this is not just for people, well, it's anyone who's interested within the college in general. Uh, so just send me uh, an address. We know that some of the Vancouver folk decide to retire in the Okanagan and so might be uh, happy to join us on some of our trips. So this year, uh, so far, uh, starting out in September, we had our annual um, uh, retreat uh, where we get together and discuss uh, the various visions we've had for the college and uh, the action goals that we're working on to try and implement these uh, the various visions so we started off uh, this is the third year of the of this uh, strategic plan and we had four pillars um, and uh, that we realized that those were the fundamental uh, pillars of the the um, emeritus college and uh, from the four pillars in our discussions of how to carry out our actions, we developed eight goals, and we had uh, reports on the people, the lead people, carrying out the actions on these goals. And um, the the um, we heard discussions on those, and then there would be a bit more planning on what to do in our last year here to carry on that. Um, we've had. Um, we're reactivating the unit, uh, the unit reps. These are reps who are uh, representative of the various departments, at the university, and um, their um, goal or responsibilities are to convey the um, benefits, I think, that uh, belonging to the Emeritus College will bring and uh, making sure that uh, the departments are aware of those and the advantages of, of belonging. 
Uh, we're also very much trying to recruit volunteers. We want to make sure that more and more people are in volunteers. We've got these uh, these SIG groups, um, the special interest groups, and uh, they all need volunteers. So uh, in order to carry some of these plans forward, we do need volunteers. And the the um, we're preparing for our grand opening. This is the opening for the members at the uh, college. The university opening of uh, Brock Commons will happen in October, early October. But in uh, February, next February, we're planning for a grand opening for our members at uh, our new space in the, in the uh, Brock Commons. So stay tuned for that. So... Um, Don't forget, we have um, uh, every year we we uh, have annual awards made, and this is a heads up for that. Last year's recipients, to remind you, were Sima. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sima Godfrey, um, Excellence in Innovation and Creative Endeavors, and Bob Armstrong uh, for distinguished service. And the deadline for that is February the twenty seventh. Do we also award uh, subsidies or give subsidies for scholarly activities? Um, we had 32 requests totaling 97,796. So it just shows you the scholarly activities that are being carried on by our uh, by our Maritai and Emerita, oh, Maritai, sorry, applies to both. And um, from the Faculty of Arts, Medicine, Education, Science, Applied Science, Land and Food System and the School of Music. So a lot of activity going on there. And the newsletter it will be, should be coming out the first week of October. Now, uh, October the 1st is the day for older persons. And um, we have uh, today uh, Diane Newell to speak about this and tell you a bit about this. Uh, Diane is uh, one of our unique members, I think this is safe to say, she was the last president of the Association for Professors Emeriti and the first principal of the Emeritus College. So welcome, Diane, and uh, give the floor over to you. Thank you very much. That was a really busy year <laughs> and a long year. Um, I have been asked to talk about the World Day of Older Persons, which is what we're celebrating now, and it's on October 1st, although it's not, we fit it into the schedule, uh, and our, of our uh, connections with the uh, European Association of Professors Meriti, who were really behind this kind of initiative and, and has worked with us very closely. October 1st marks a 1920, as an historian, I have to tell you, I still I'll say 19 instead of 20, so forgive me. 2024 marks the 34th celebration of the United Nations International Day of um, Day of Older Persons. In Canada, this day is celebrated each year as National Seniors Day. That's what it's called in Canada. And in Europe, the European Association of Professors Emeriti refer to it as the World Day of Older Persons. It doesn't really matter what it's called, but um, the celebration has the same sort of focus. This year, as part of the global celebration of this important date, the Emeritus College of UBC designated its opening general meeting today for the 24-25 special talk by um, Emeritus College member Carol Christopher, uh, who is uh, heavily connected and for a long time with SPEC, the Society for the Promotion of Environment in Canada, and um, and and she and she has particularly been active in the area of of SPEC elders, but SPEC is involved in promoting with other organizations, national organizations, uh, a World Day of Seniors World Day on climate change a seniors climate change ac action. Um, and at the date of this presentation, um, the date of this as a second initiative, the date of this present um, issue of the college newsletter has been moved up to October 1st. So we'll be receiving it next week. 
um, in recognition of the importance of our commitment to this International Day of Older Persons. This Loving the Earth presentation by Carol will be introduced by Ann Junker, who arranged for this talk and will introduce Carol. The initiative, I think, aligns well with the mission of the college and is a founding aspiration, of, uh, follows the founding aspiration of the UN International Day of Older Persons, promoting intergenerational models. In 1990, the UN Assembly declared October 1st the International Day of Older Persons. Well, it's got an acronym, UNIDROP, but I don't hear it uh, mentioned very often. By older persons was meant those who are 65 years and older, which in 1990 probably didn't, wasn't something anyone would question, but I think we would question it today. Especially as the UN calculates that, um, well calculated last year that we will be living 20, years longer, and this year that we'll be living 25 years longer than um, we could have expected. So um, it also says that by 2030, older persons globally are projected to outnumber youth globally. So it kind of shifts uh, what we want to talk about, I think, and what our connections are with this day, what we want to be reminded of. A recent annual theme, there's a theme every year, I think most people don't follow what it is because it's, it's, a fairly, it's, it's fairly open to different nations how they celebrate this, but it was fulfilling the province of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for Older Persons across generations. So it's back to that intergenerational um, theme. As a final note, the European Association of Professors Emeriti under the direction of former president and editor, uh, Professor Emeritus Natalie Gaspare de Santo, is responsible for our involvement in the October 1st celebrations. The European organization promotes and collects information on the events taking place in Europe and beyond, and it features its findings in a full issue of the impressive bulletin of the Association of Professors Emeriti that it produces. In this regard, APE had developed a special relationship with the college, including initiating and participating in a joint celebration October 1st, 2021, uh, titled the APE Emeritus College International Webinar Panel on Healthy Aging. Then in 2023, the Council of the Emeritus um, College decided it would be in keeping with the current content of the newsletter to showcase a special supplement to the newsletter sampling retiree activities of our members. And, uh, and we did that on not October 1st, but October the 4th. So we, we take a bit of liberties with our timing, but it all goes to the same cause. The team of Cal Cal Carolyn Gilbert, Judith Hall, Wendy Hall, and Diane Newell co-edited the supplement uh, with the kind cooperation of our new, who is our new editor, uh, Val White was just starting. Um, it, it was a great help. Now these uh, records of these activities are, are to be found on our website if you want to uh, look at them uh, more carefully. I am, uh, I am with the Department of History and the Institute of Oceans and Fisheries. And among other things, I'm a founding member of the October 1st Committee on the World Day of Older Persons of the European Association of Professors Emerita. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone who's helped with these activities. Oh, I had one more activity to mention, and that is our third initiative for this year is at Monday at 4 p.m., I believe, our, we'll be previewing the um, film All Our Relations uh, by emeritus professors, um, it's an inst uh, who were in an inst uh, inter sorry uh, interdisciplinary uh, project on climate change, uh, I believe, led by Olaf Slaymaker. So we actually have made three efforts this year to acknowledge the date. Thank you very much. Sorry for the halting nature of my talk.
Well, that just gave me a chance to turn my phone off. So. <laughs> So I'm Ann Junker, and I am uh, very pleased to introduce Carol Christopher as today's speaker. Carol and I have been neighbors for 40 years, and I think we first started talking about this presentation while we were out in our gardens picking uh, Carol's raspberries, which have crept over the border. Carol is a member of the Emeritus College, and she's an active participant in the community volunteer SIG. Carol has a doctorate in nutrition and has developed and taught university and adult education courses for 45 years. She promotes local, sustainable, and just food. She's going to speak more today about her commitment to the Society Promoting Environmental Conservation, or SPEC, which is the oldest environmental organization in Vancouver. Carol has been a SPEC director since 1996 she chaired the Sustainable Food Team and co-founded their school garden program. Carol was president of the SPEC board for five years. And during this time, she undertook a reconciliation decolonization initiative. And in response to becoming an elder herself, started the SPEC Elders Circle, which she's going to talk to us about. Carol has served on many community boards and advisory councils, including being past chair of the Vancouver Food Policy Council, advising city council on food security. She is a master gardener, and this is a qualified certification. And at her home just outside the UBC Point Grey campus, so that she's not on a farm, this is in the city, she maintains a lush garden with fruit trees and a bee-friendly garden in the back and a front yard full of grow boxes, which provide a regular and rich source of vegetables, herbs, and other edibles. Carol speaks and offers workshops on topics related to food security and becoming an elder. She is an avid jazz vocalist a dedicated meditation practitioner, and in 2018 was acknowledged by the City of Vancouver for her 35 years of volunteer work in the community as the recipient of the Vancouver Award of Excellence in the category of Healthy City for All. So welcome, Carol, and we look forward to this presentation. I don't think I don't, I don't think Bob's in there. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> So let me see, first of all, I, I've turned a microphone on. Can you hear me? No. Well, then let me take this. Maybe in that case, I'll di divest myself of this. <laughs> I'm... Okay, here we go. Okay, now you can hear me. Okay, fine. So, um, do you want to start the, the uh, go ahead. Oh, yes, it's my job, that's right. <laughs> there we go. Don't you think that's a great slide? <laughs> so, I'm Carol Christopher, and I have been, as you now know, on the board of SPEC for way lot longer than most people stay on boards, almost, well over, well over 25 years. And about a decade, or a little more than a decade ago, actually, probably around 2012, I was walking with my husband one day, and we ran into some other friends, and we were talking all about where we'd just come from, or where we were going, and what food we were eating, what wine we were drinking, what books we were reading. But I noticed that we didn't talk about young people and the world that we were leaving for them. And, Without raising an, an, an inordinately difficult topic, it is a very difficult world that we're going to be leaving behind. And so I began to wonder, what happened to elders? And I started having this phrase pop up in my mind, elders. We should reclaim the role of elders in our Western society. And as this kind of played out, I would have conversations with people and say, well, do you, do you feel like you're an elder? I mean, isn't there something about being an elder? And people would almost inevitably say, oh, I think that's a great idea, but I don't have any wisdom. And so it occurred to me that it was time to start some kind of process of elders, seniors, 
talking with one another and reinvigorating and encouraging us to believe that we have something to share, something valuable to contribute. So I started the SPEC Elder Circle. And it's a part of SPEC if you want to go to, oh, it's my job, sorry. So SPEC is an environmental organization and said the oldest one in Vancouver. In fact, we think it might be the oldest one in Canada, the oldest environmental NGO. There are definitely organizations that were involved with na nature organizations before that. But it's pretty old. We're 55 years old this year. And this, the Elder Circle is about a decade old. Now, I'm not going to read all of these, but just to give you a sense that there's a lot of programs that are happening in SPEC as an organization. One of the major programs is the food team. Another one is energy and transportation. Another one on the next slide is the um, zero waste team. And I'm going to actually come out where I can see this. If I do that, do I get seriously in your way? OK. So also a team that's called Climate Resilience, which is really pulling together from all of the different teams to provide some programming that is like not quite so siloed. And then the one that I'm now most involved with is the Elder Circle. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to talk about the programs that were involved to give you an idea. So one of them, which is called Networking and Outreach to Other Elder Organizations, that actually is the stream that is now working with elders across the country to encourage elders to come out, well, seniors, uh, uh, seniors slash elders. I much prefer the term elders. But anyway, that's encouraging them to get involved on International Day of the Older Person, which is also the National Seniors Day for Canada, and to do something and let the rest of us know what you're doing, put it on a map, get it in front of, eventually get it in front of our uh, politicians saying seniors slash elders want climate action. We want it now. We want it to be effective. We want to change the course of things as they're now headed in terms of what's going to be the future faced by our children and grandchildren and all the future generations. So that's one stream. Another stream, and one that I'm very excited about, is working with Indigenous elders to bring Western and Indigenous elders together with youth to start to develop land-based understanding, land-based curriculum, and to reconnect us to the earth. It's my view, and I think it's shared by a lot of folks, that one of the reasons that we're kind of in the fix that we are is that we've lost our deep spiritual connection with the land. And so we treat the land as something to dominate rather than something that is the, actually the vital source of our well-being on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Another program is leading what's called just learning circles, where we invite people once every couple of months to come in usually this is a Zoom session, and talk about what it means to be an elder, or what we're doing in the elder circle. And they may or may not continue on, but that's a way to kind of get engaged, get involved. Uh, we do some courses and we publish those. Another, another program is called Maturing as Elders. It isn't the case that you can just say, I'm an elder. Being an elder involves accepting the role the responsibilities of being an elder and the rewards of being an elder. And so, oh, I thought you were going to ask a question, Rhea, sorry. <laughs> so in, in, as, as elders, we need to continually be thinking about how do we embrace a wider and wider understanding of what it means to embrace the responsibilities of an elder and receive the rewards. When people are working as elders, often in the community, the community doesn't know that there's a lot of people that are giving very dedicated service to a variety of things. And so we've been doing recently something called Elders in Our Midst, which is writing profiles, 
putting them together with actually portraits done by a professional artist that we then will display to say to society, we have elders and these elders are doing important work. Um, Okay, well, I think that gives a reasonable picture of some of the work that's going on in SPEC, so I'll move ahead and ask the question, well, why an elder circle? And we've sort of come right to that in the point of our discussion. Elders are seniors are often thought of as people needing services. And while there's truth to that, if you look in magazines, you see the pictures mostly show seniors as people that are having a good time together, perhaps, or being serviced in some way, often looking kind of helpless, when in fact, seniors, elders, have a tremendous amount to give as contributions to society. And so that's one of the things we're really focusing on uh, to help people understand, not just we know it because we're living in these seniors' bodies and we know we have contributions to make, but our society at large, for the most part, is still a fairly ageist society. It's changing. I get more and more young people all the time that are kind of coming and looking for advice and, and, and wanting some kind of mentoring. And that may be happening to you. So I think it's changing, but we still have quite an ageist society. So it's important that we make it clear we need services and we have things to give. We're facing an epic crisis in biodiversity loss, climate change, massive weaponry, social polarization, and more. And there is a real need for the wisdom. It seems like wisdom is in short supply. And I believe, and I hope that you believe too, that elders can make an important contribution in bringing that. We have age-related skills. We have experience. We've been through things. We know that there's another side to many things that's, that we've gone through that have been very difficult. So we have things to offer. And I believe that there's actually, we're on the brink of an important uh, step uh, in our consciousness, a new level of human consciousness, and that I believe elders can really play an important leading role in helping us to move out of some of the habits of mind that we have and into a more a deeper understanding of what it means to be a mature human being, a mature elder. Okay. So I'm just going to pose these questions for you if you can see the screen. In fact, maybe what I'll do is switch over here for a moment. What does the word elder mean to you? And is being a senior different than being an elder? Do you find within yourself that you aspire to be an elder? Do you perhaps feel that you are an elder? All of these are interesting things to just query yourself about. Do you feel like you're an elder? There are characteristics to an elder, and these are characteristics that have come along. There's a kind of a confluence from different sources. Certainly, historically, we've looked at particular individuals and noted something about their qualities that caused us to regard them with special respect. And they come down through the ages as people that we might call them elders, we might call them something else, but we have a sense of their carrying a wisdom of the culture. So that's one source of the kinds of uh, characteristics that people embrace as wise people. Uh, another source of that these particular characteristics is from sociology or psychology in, in academic studies, and finally from neuroscience. So what I'm saying is that there's a, there's a list that you see here. It was gathered from a variety of sources. And when you put all of the different lists together, this is pretty clear. I think this is a pretty good list. I have quite a bit of confidence that what's said here kind of covers the waterfront of what it means to be a wise elder. And so let's just take a quick look at them. Empathy and compassion. 
that's the ability to imaginatively think into the experience of another person and care about what they're experiencing. S emotional self-regulation. There is a, an, an interesting book. I think it's called Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Do you know it? Have any of you read it? Can you kind of guess at what the title means? You know, basically, when the zebra is under threat, they can put on the steam and run away with a tremendous supercharge, probably lots of, of adrenaline and what's the other one? Cortisol. But when the chase is over, assuming they don't get caught, they relax and they relax totally and they come back to equilibrium apparently very quickly. Good for them because that's not what our situation is for the most part. We get triggered and then we we ruminate. We're not ruminants, but we ruminate. And we keep that going and sometimes you know, feeding ourselves stress hormones for long intervals of time. And this leads, of course, to a lot of chronic conditions. So we want to learn to be more like the zebras. We want to learn how to use the skills that the neuroscience and other uh, disciplines know that it's possible to soothe and ease your, your um, uh, triggered state. And that's possible to learn. Uh, overcoming the negativity bias. It's considered that the negativity bias is an evolutionary skill or trait. We pay a lot more attention to what's going wrong or could go wrong than what's going right or could go right. And the result of that is that we tend to look at situations and see the negative side much more quickly and, and stay in, in that kind of frame of mind uh, more quickly than looking at the positive side. As an elder, we learn to balance those sides. Self-reflective just means being able to be aware where is my body right now in space? What's happening? What are the signals from my body? What's I'm, what am I feeling? What are my emotions? Most people don't have a lot access to a, 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 a wide inventory of understanding what their emotional state is. What am I thinking? What do I ten, tend to be thinking about? Sometimes, if I, I don't know if this would happen to you, but I said to you, if I were to say to you right now, what are you thinking? Some of you are going to be thinking about what I'm saying. Others are going to be thinking about other things that are going on in your life. The question is, do you know? Are you aware? And building that kind of awareness, self-reflective awareness, is very supportive of a a, a deeper, more contented state of your own life. And you, of course, then bring that into wherever you are. Embracing uncertainty. We live in a world that is full of impermanence. And yet, as humans, we want control. And how do we gain that control? Well, the best way to gain control is to embrace uncertainty. If you can f kind of follow that idea, you don't get control but you have a lot more relaxed um, spaciousness in your life if you can embrace uncertainty. Elders are generous, decisive, pro-social. I'm moving quickly through these and spiritual. And I, I, I want to just say about the uh, pro-social, very inclusive. We don't exclude particular groups or even particular people, though I would say that's a long journey in life to be able to include everybody. But that's where we want to go. Yeah, I have one that I can't include right now. I bet you know who it is, too. And spiritual is a large part of the spiritual aspect is could be religious, and that's great. But it also should involve our relationship with nature. There's a deep spiritual connection that we need to restore. Uh, if, if you're indigenous, you may already have that and not need to restore it. But most of Western society has, needs to be thinking about how we deeply restore that relationship. Okay, so 
the Dalai Lama actually mentions three things that he says make life happier. Now, happiness and wisdom aren't necessarily completely equivalent. But if you're a wise person and a wise soul, then you are probably contented in a way that is a very important quality of happiness. So the Dalai Lama says that, first of all, we need to uh, reframe our situation more positively. We need to also have the ability to experience gratitude and to come at the world with kindness and generosity. And I give you those because I think they're kind of like an umbrella over the other nine. If we were to take those other nine, I think we could probably fit most of them in one way or another into those three bigger ideas. Oh, now you can't read this, so please don't try. Well, maybe if you're sitting up front, you can. But here's the point. This is about our emotionality. And I wanted to bring this in because I think that this is, is a helpful thing to, to, to sort of give a, give a bit of guidance to people. Maybe as serious scholars and academics were a little more on top of this, but I'm not so sure. Most people can only really identify about seven major emotions. We, and some people only know if they're happy or, or, or sad or afraid. But there's a possibility that you know when you're angry, you know when you're fearful, you know when you're feeling bad. These are not only small, they're out of focus, aren't they? You know when you're surprised. You may know when you're, you do know usually when you're happy and so, or disgusted. Now, that's good if you have those seven, but it's even better if you can nuance those and you know if you're happy whether you're playful or content or interested or proud or you're feeling accepted or powerful or peaceful or trusting or optimistic. Those are just a little bit different one from the other. The importance of this is when you can adequately name, understand, um, uh, I guess name is the right word for it, the actual emotion that you're feeling the more specific you can be, the more these emotions tend to flow on and your life, you, stand, you spend more time in being able to be in the present moment rather than being kind of focused and ruminating on not feeling good, but you don't know why. I've spent a lot of time there. I, I'm not sure, of course, about you. So... This is a quote from Joanna Macy, at this point it will be like a, re, a bit of a refocus now to the talk, because I'm going to now say something that, um, that leads us into this climate action that's happening on October the 1st. Joanna Macy says, the great unraveling is undeniably happening. The climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, polarization, massive weaponry, not very well controlled, on and on. This is happening. And the world is never going to be the same. But the other side of it is the great turning is also underway. There are a lot of important and wonderful things that are happening in the world. And there is, of course, the big question, are they going to come into balance in a, in, in a way that, that uh, allows the species to go forward without a major collapse and calamity? Uh, we certainly hope so. And an example of this great part of this great turning, I don't want to way over blow its importance, but I think it's really important that elders, seniors are getting involved. We know there's a big movement in the United States called uh, Third Act. Bill McGibbon, who's a climate organizer, started Third Act because this is the, we're not we, I'm a generation ahead of the, the baby boomers. But uh, that generation uh, was very involved, and so some of you are going to be in that generation, very involved in the civil rights movement. Well, actually, I was involved in that too, but I bet some of you were. Also very involved in the women's movement. And now he's saying, come back, and the third act for this group is the environmental movement. So in Canada, 
we're just catching up a couple of years late, but that's okay. Uh, there's a group in the East that started this, which is to pull some of the major national groups that are concerned with seniors and seniors' well-being and so on, pull them together and say, okay, let's get seniors involved in climate action. And the slogan is, later is too late. And I, I, I suspect you understand that slogan. So seniors, elders have influence. We vote and politicians know that we vote. Bill McGibbon likes to say, you can't, it's, not, it's almost nothing you can do to keep an, a senior from voting. <laughs> so it's important if we use our vote that we use it in a way that isn't just for our own self-satisfaction, but is for the well-being of our children, grandchildren, and future generations. Also, we are, and I put in parentheses, collectively wealthy. It's not as well distributed as it should be, but we're the wealthiest segment in society. And it's understandable in a way. We've had a lifetime of collecting and accumulating, and we, uh, we, we, we have the results of that. But now the question is, how do we use that? How do we use our wealth? How can we use it to benefit future generations? And we care. There is something that happens in the elder that I think is a natural process, and so you may feel it in you. And that is, as in one physician, oh, gee, I'm going to forget his name. Anyway, he says, when we see that far horizon, when it begins to be a little more obvious, the far horizon, our priorities shift. And we start to feel less concerned about the things that concerned us when we were 20, 30, 40, 50, even 60. And now we start to have a natural concern for, well, what's going to happen after we leave? How are these generations coming along behind me? How are they going to do? What can I do to make this a better experience for them? So this caring, we can just care for ourselves and our families, or we can care for the whole global community, and not just the humans. We can care about all our relations. So these are the things that Seniors for Climate are wanting to do. Encourage seniors, elders, to speak up and speak out about the climate. Not only on October 1st, because this is a movement, we're building a movement, but October 1st is a big target date because we're also asking people to put what they're doing on a map and we're putting all those maps together on national map and we're taking them to the politicians and saying elders care and elders vote. And uh, so we're advocating and as I said, we're building a movement. Be a part of this movement. The Speck elders and the Suzuki elders made a decision in May that we would join together as the BC hub for Seniors for Climate. So we're the group in British Columbia that's fanning all this information out across the province, giving them new messages every week with more ideas, with more resources, some of it coming from the national group, some of it coming from stuff that we've worked up ourselves. Um, but we're doing the best we can to really get as many people around the province to know about it and to be engaged. And uh, in addition, and I'll, I'll come along in a moment and say we're also doing a day on the first, which was already mentioned. Okay, so here's the things that we're wanting people to do as they communicate about the environment, about the climate crisis in particular. One is the severity of the consequences are getting worse. The disasters are getting worse. But we don't want to linger and badger people too much with too much doom and gloom. Now the, the research is clearly saying that's not what motivates people. People need to know that 
in a way they do know it, but we don't know it as well as we would know it if we talk about it with each other. So disasters are getting worse. There are, and, the, and they're caused by emissions. I'll come to a slide in a moment which may astonish you, but I'll wait to astonish you. Um, there are solutions. And that it's important that we start to move on those solutions now. <clears throat> so break the silence. Have the conversation. We're afraid to have the conversation because we don't want to we don't want to get into a situation where we feel we're going to like upset people or it's going to become a little bit hostile. But the reality is that by being quiet, we are kind of acquiescing to go down quietly. And we need to stop doing that and start talking about how we feel as elders about what we're leaving behind and what's happening to these kids. The second thing is we need to talk about fossil fuels. It's hard to believe that 50% of Canadians don't actually make the connection between fossil fuels and climate warming. Now, part of that is busy people not paying terribly close attention. Another part of it is lots of misinformation and reassurance, don't worry, fossil fuels are OK, we're a part of the solution, and so on. And so it's important, and it's important that we do this in a way where we are being very straightforward and plain in our language. You dig up fossil fuels. In order to use them, you have to ignite them. They burn. They give off emissions, including carbon dioxide, but others. And they go into the atmosphere, and they prevent the heat from the accumulated heat from being released and the Earth maintaining, it does not have the capacity to keep, to kind of cleanse the air, to let the heat back out. And so the heat builds up, the temp, it's just simple, simple. But let people hear it, because the words are often so complex that people just turn, tune out. And then the other thing is, get this, talk about love. We don't like to talk about love because love is soft. And we want to be hard and punch and get the real difficult stuff, you know? But what really changes people is love. And this has been such a surprise to the climate communicators that have been working now very diligently for about a decade to understand what's the message that works, the message that works is a message that includes something that people love. People change because they encounter something that has love in it. Anger and blame are the worst ways to change people. And it's important to cultivate that healthy inner life that development of elder skills, that compassion, that embracing uncertainty, that pro-social attitudes, those things. Important to grow our inner life, our maturity, in order that we don't make things worse by getting caught in, in verbal situations that do make, the, do make it worse. We can learn how to initiate skillful behaviors and persist. This is what's happening on October the 1st. And I would invite all of you, or any of you, to come and join us and uh, be a part of uh, films that will be shown. One of your colleagues, Frank Tester, has done two films already and is in the process of putting the funding together to do two more from the Emeritus College. But one of Frank's films will be shown, along with four other films that are all about what we're going through at this stage in our human existence with climate change. There's going to be other things. There's going to be line dancing and music and postcards to your member of parliament and so on. So please do come drop in or come and stay for a long time, uh, whatever works well for you.
And I, I see there's a few cameras out, so I'll give you a moment to take that picture before I take it down. There's also a couple of these on tables there at the back that you can go and look at if you want to. Okay, now the question is, what can you do? And I would say, if I had talked with you two weeks ago or two months ago, I would have said something different. But we're now talking about an event that's going to happen in about five days. So I tried to think, well, what could they do? Well, here's something you could do that would actually be quite helpful. You could take out your phones. I'm not suggesting necessarily that you do that right now, because if we all did this at the same time, it would be chaos. But vertically with your phone, do a selfie in which you answer one of these questions. Maybe you want to answer all three of them, but they'd like really, the, the national office is putting these out as they come in. And they're just a way to keep the flow of information going. This is what seniors think. This is what seniors want. This is what seniors have to say about how we want the world to be for younger generations. What it means later is too late and why it's important for seniors, elders to get involved. And this is what would be important. You could take your phone out and go to your email and write yourself a draft that says bc-hub at seniorsforclimate.org. And then you would have it all ready when you, you don't have to worry about what the email address is when you do your, your, uh, your little 30 second video. Okay. Now I would like to have any questions that you have, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the Elder Circle, about this event that's happening on the first, whatever. Who has a question? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Carol's going to keep the mic, and I think we've got one circulation if people can just start off away. Mark, start us off. Can everyone hear me? Probably not. Can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah, I like your distinction between senior and elder. In my opinion, senior is a chronological factor, age, age, which is older, but elder has a connotation which is very impressive to me. It's about perspective, wisdom, all the things you're talking about. So mm -hmm. personally, I'm avoiding uh, the stigmatization of aging using the words senior because it gets so abused. And so we cut that right out. But I think elders is perfect. Great. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, thank you, Mark. I just want to know, has this been recorded? I think it has been. We heard at the beginning. So we could, can we show this with other groups? Absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, you can. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. I really appreciate that that comment too, because I think that senior has come to be not a very positive term. An elder does hold that more dignified role in society. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that as seniors, um, most of us were brought up trying to save things and not waste and that repair, reuse, recycle are words which are baked into our DNA. And that seems to me to be one of the big things that we can teach the younger generation. Uh, what would you have to say to that? Well, yes, I, I think that is one of the things that we can do. And I just want to point out that one of the things that SPEC does is it has a big uh, repair cafe where uh, about on a monthly basis, somewhere in the city of Vancouver, there is an installation where there's people with sewing machines, people with bike repair equipment, people with uh, skills to look at electronics, just about everything you can imagine. And they always fill up. And there's always a few people that just kind of show up and, and bring things. And so you can try that, but it's even better if you're, you're interested to to show up. But to go back to your question, I think there is an important ethic that you're talking about of, of repair, recycle, uh, and uh, refill rather than always just toss and toss. 
I think the young kids are getting that. I do. But I still think that it's something to, this is another conversation, this is a part of the conversation. Because it, it, it's really not a separate conversation, is it? This is a part of what has created climate change, is an industrial society that's just making things way more, way faster, way, uh, way with more waste, uh, energy use, and so on, faster than the Earth can take care of itself. Yes. Thank you. Go I, ahead. I, I very much enjoyed uh, your, your presentation. And Thank you. I'd like to just comment on that question number one. What type of world do you want younger generations to inherit? Well, as a baby boomer, I, I re remember in elementary school being uh, told that the United Nations was going to solve the world's problems. And as I've gone through the 60 or 70 years since I was in elementary school, I don't see that some of these large international organizations have really been very helpful or, or very effective. What, what, what's your thought about uh, something like the United Nations and its effectiveness or ineffectiveness? You know, I don't think I really have a big opinion. Um, I don't see it as inept, and I see them as organizing a very important international conferences around a number of things. And of course, the climate uh, conferences have been very important. It seems to me maybe the difficulty lies more with getting the member states of the United States to actually uh, em em embrace their responsibilities. So I don't find it so, uh, I don't have a big criticism of it as an idea, as an important idea. I think it, you know, maybe over time it will be strengthened. Maybe over time it will cease to be. I, I don't know. But I understand why you feel as you do. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't, I haven't developed for myself a, 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 a much of an opinion about except I have a fairly positive opinion that it's a good organization to have in the world. That many things might go worse if we didn't have it. Maybe I would say that. Yeah, but I'm not sure. Yes, Frank. Frank Tester. Um, those of you who show up uh, on October the 1st will see a film that I directed, which involves a uh, an elder, an Inuk elder, Silawak Cloutier, a friend of mine and someone who's incredibly well known. Her work uh, dealing with Arctic climate change is uh, internationally recognized. In fact, she was nominated along with Al Gore for the Nobel Prize for her work. She's in conversation with four students, four UBC students, three of whom are Indigenous. But I want to deal with the issue of anger because a lot of young people, and I work with young people around climate change and environmental issues, especially in Nunavut, uh, where 50% of the population are under 23 years of age. So I work with Inuit youth a great deal, but not just with Inuit youth. I also work with young people in Vancouver uh, who are having trouble with the law, many of whom are also Indigenous. Anger is something that's a reality among young people, especially when it comes to looking at what our generation has done to the planet, and that's the way they see it often. They're very angry. They're also ang anxiety uh, ridden, um, and I'm, I, anger is not something that can be disappeared. And, but I'm not sure that anger is necessarily a, a negative emotion. It's a it's it's a reality, and young people are angry. I mean, Greta, Greta Thunberg is a very angry young woman, but I'd be have a hard time saying that her anger hasn't resulted in some pretty amazing change and brought to our attention things that are are really important. So I'm not really um, not really against anger, and I, I respect and appreciate people who are angry. Uh, getting in touch with why they're angry and what that anger can be directed towards that might bring positive changes, I think, really important. Thanks. And I and, and I really agree with you, Frank. Uh, it's not a bad emotion. It's an important emotion when we're having it to know that's what's happening. And it's also important to not feed an emotion in a way that is dangerous for our own health and well-being. But I in no way am saying that young people don't have an absolute perfect right to feel angry that they're inheriting a world that is so different. And on the other hand, that has come 
about as a result of many generations of decisions and, and actions and behaviors that were taken. So it's not our fault only that this is happening, but it is important that we play our role now because it's happening now and we're here now and we're elders. So, yes, there is a time to be solid like ice, and there's a time to thaw and flow with love. I have a quote. I'm reminded, love is the glue of the universe. It prevents us from disintegrating. Yet, we have these powerful impulses to greed and hatred that threaten the integrity of that glue. It's imperative that we welcome and come back to the glue. That could be the end, but I bet there's another question. I hope there's another question. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you, she's going to give you the, I have a hearing problem, so I need to hear so you. So you had mentioned a slide about emissions. Do you have that? to share with us? No. Oh, no, I don't have a slide about emissions. Oh, did, okay. did you want me to repeat that it's important when we talk? Well, I'm just thinking, you know, as we're entering into acts the carbon tax, <laughs> you know, I just kind of like to have more information myself with respect to uh -huh. our emissions and what, right, how we're living and what we're not doing that we should be doing. I could comment on that. Carbon uh, ha having a cap on emissions and a carbon tax is a pretty well-known and successful way to reduce carbon emissions. But it also, unfortunately, is a tax. And North Americans, probably maybe more than any other population in the world, very resentful towards taxes. And so it's pretty easy to rouse them against this tax, which is what's happening in this upcoming whenever election at the national level. Um, but there is no doubt that it is a successful way, one of the strategies, policies that can be very helpful in lowering emissions. And that is what we have to do. There is no way to dig that up and burn it and throw it into the atmosphere without intensifying the situation that we're in. And that's why we have to have this conversation. Yeah, I don't know, does that help? Yeah, yeah. Being, being in an environmental organization, I, I have the information, I hope I'm communicating it in a way that's supportive and helpful for you. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, I think it's on. Um, it is. Are, are we committing enough resources to alternative sources of energy? I'm thinking geothermal, solar, hydraulic, even nuclear. And do you want to comment on the goods and bads of all of them? Uh, I don't know if I'll get all the way to that, but what I will say is probably not enough, but now they have started to reach the exponential stage of growth. So there is really, it's taking off. The renewable resources, they're going to shut down the fossil fuel industry. But there also has to be, while they continue to get on that, really on that upper slope of, of exponential growth, it's important to limit, 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 limit what the fossil fuel industry can do. But it, so that's a really good news story, what's happening with renewables. You know, heat pumps, solar panels, geothermal, nuclear, you know, I don't know because I spent a long time in the anti-war movement so nuclear is still kind of like, mm, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. And yet people that I respect say that it's an important transition fuel. I'm not expert enough 
to give you an answer to that. I, I may not be a microphone. You may not. Your, your talk is marvelous and, and very, That's very hopefully nice. impactful. I'm reflecting on that slide where you talked about a shocking 50% of the population, if I quote the slide correctly, are unaware, did you say, that of the connection with fossil fuels? I know. It's Why? A, Why? I mean, is it denial? Some is of it. it ignorance? Of it. Or what do you think is the problem here because my gosh you'd have to be living in a cave well no not these are, uh, these are people living right here amongst us so is it denial then well it's it's listening to denial it's listening to new media sources that say that it's not really important or i don't know if you heard the conversation that was reported between eon musk and and donald you know who that that um were wildly stating how many years it was going to take to get into a certain level of carbon dioxide. But if you're listening to that day after day after day, and people saying it's not really a problem, and your social network is not correcting you, even if they kind of have the thought you might be wrong, but we're not going to talk about it, because I don't want to be uncomfortable, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but if you're willing to have a little discomfort, you can say, wait, do you, let me tell you something. This is caused by carbon emissions. This is caused by burning fossil fuels. But people, yes, it's astonishing to me. But I've seen it now so many times, I'm no longer astonished. I know it's the case. It might be changing. It might be 45%. But it's, a, it's, a, it's why, anyway, I won't go there. I am in, uh, vaguely embarrassed to raise another date, but I wanted to be sure that the Emerita didn't forget September 30th yes. to wear your orange shirt. Yes. Now, having done that, I would ask you to tell us more about our connection with the land. So as you introduced the, the association, yes. you said we need to go back to the land. And to me, that is so First Nations. Yes. So could you say more about that? Well, and a, and a part of the, the beauty of the work that we're doing is we're doing it with First Nations elders. And, um, but, you know, I, I actually think even if we were not successful at um, finding a relationship with First Nations elders uh, or with First Nations people in general who still have an intact relationship with the land, the land... They, the land is in them. The land is in us. The land is in us. We breathe the air, we eat the food, we drink the water. That's the substance of our bodies. And our spiritual relationship with the land is the substance of our well-being. So the land is in us too. Even if we didn't have a relationship with indigenous elders, we need to reground ourselves in the land and understand who we are and what we are on this planet. But it's a beautiful thing too to have indigenous elders that are willing to say, yes, we love you. They love us. We love you, and we want to work with you. We want to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk on a topic that could have gone weak, but it went strong, <laughs> and appreciate it very much. Thank you. Uh, just there's three points. One, the later is too late struck us both as uh, it's kind of that has a certain negativity. Now is the time might be a more positive way of expressing. It. I think it's very right. I feel motivated by what you're saying, and I sort of feel acting now. So there are some ways, and I, I just uh, two things. We, in speaking about our retirement fund management, the fossil free funds idea of shifting your own. This is something you can do in shifting your own uh, retirement funds to be invested in organizations that are, or companies that are, you know, promote, pr 
promote fossil free funds. So that's yes. one thing. And particularly, I le recently learned about a wonderful group called Get Set Up. Get Set Up, which is a is 4 million people who take courses or give courses. These are older adults giving courses for older adults and others. So there are 5,000 older adults who have shared their expertise and contributed in the ways you're describing. I encourage you to give your speech as a video that would be available on a widespread basis. So thank you again. Thank you. And I think there's many things. And maybe others have other ideas of what we can do. But now is the time, I thank think. Thank you. You know, the uh, uh, now is too late was very, very uh, controversial within the network that was asked to put all this stuff out, too negative, too negative. So your comment is 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 right on with what a lot of people were feeling. Uh, but eventually we we went with the what the national group wanted to do. But it is it is a question. How do we talk about this? Um, the other thing is, yes, so important, move our money. If we leave our money in those funds that are supporting fossil fuels, we're essentially endorsing the future that's already starting to happen. So there are places, Van City is one of them, where you can put your money that they are, we think they're pretty, we think they're responsible. We meaning my husband and I, I'm not speaking for spec in this instance, so. I hate stopping, but I think it's time to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Carol. That's uh, just a remarkable talk, uh, full of information. I think it's presented too with the uh, from the attitude of love, as you say, and uh, which is uh, much more, I think. Uh, much better attitude to get people talking and agreeing with one another. Anyway, as a, a presentation from Emeritus College, we'd like to present oh, you with our it. special, <laughs> and as we say, uh, much coveted uh, umbrella from the Emeritus College. Carol, Carol mentioned, alluded to her piece uh, work activities. Uh, um, my wife, Jean, and Carol were working on the in the peace movement back in the well, many years ago, and uh, trying to get council to uh, declare Vancouver a nuclear-free zone because uh, warships were coming into the harbor, and we didn't know whether they were carrying nuclear weapons or not. But uh, anyway, little did I recognize that 40 years later, I'd be presenting you with this umbrella. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carol. And the uh, the the um, uh, reference to September the 30th with Orange Shirt Day, uh, there is a march on campus too. I'd like to remind people. Maybe you've seen the notice already. Starting outside the uh, the Indigenous uh, Education Center at 11:45, I think, uh, and uh, marching down Main Mall, walking down Main Mall to the um, to the uh, totem pole. So maybe many of you will be out at that too. Uh, just summing up here with um, some of the upcoming events. The, uh, on October the 1st, as has been mentioned, the Seniors, Seniors for Climate event. Uh, this film, uh, which uh, Frank has been uh, working on and uh, many others in the climate cohort will be shown in, on Granville Island at the, what's the center again, uh, Frank? Performance Works, yes. Uh, at 4.15. On October the 21st, uh, Groves of Academe, reading by Eleanor Catton's, or from Eleanor Catton's, Burnham Wood. October the 24th is the next travel group with uh, Nancy Langton, Langton talking about Namibia. And um, this is, um, so that will be of interest to, to many of you. The October 24th, again, the Green College Series, Disciplines Through Time, the Creation, Maintenance, and Breakdown of Knowledge Boundaries. And the next general meeting, well, before that is the uh, Philosopher's Cafe. Stay tuned to that. And uh, we're going to announce the date when that comes. So many of you have been interested in the, in the uh, Philosopher's Cafe, and that should be starting up again, but we'll let you know.
Uh, next general meeting is Wednesday, November the 6th at 1 p.m. And we're going to be uh, very, very fortunate to be entertained by uh, performers from our own School of Music and uh, Nancy Hermiston beside the, behind the scenes looking at producing an opera. And that will be, will be an announcement. We'll be talking, giving you instructions about that. But that will be at the old auditorium. So that's it for today. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I've enjoyed it. It's been a wonderful meeting, and I hope you've all enjoyed it, too. Thank you.